Matthew 5, 38, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other. And if anyone wants to sue you, take your shirt, hand over your coat. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in the heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We know all about rain. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lots of backstory here. In order to make sense of what Jesus is up to at the end of chapter five, we need to rewind and unpack three pieces of backstory that Jesus puts together all in one place here in Matthew five, which means turn to the left in your Bibles to Exodus 21. Is that a train? Wow, okay, well done. Exodus 21. And uh, let's work through three pieces of background and then come back to Matthew 5 and work through the text line by line. Here we go. As you remember from a few weeks ago, the Bible of Jesus' day was called the Law and the Prophets, which was Genesis all the way up to, anybody know? Genesis all the way up to, last book in what today is called the Old Testament, Malachi. Well done. (sighs) That sermon was like a week ago, people. (laughs) Genesis to Malachi, and Jesus quotes right out of Exodus. Now, if you know the story of Exodus, chapter 20, God from the top of the mountain speaks the Ten Commandments where Jesus gets the first two examples. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Then in chapter 21, God gets into miscellaneous laws on how Israel is to live. Look at Exodus 21. Look down at 22. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, Okay, which is like the mother of all hypotheticals. (laughs) None of the other gatherings got that, by the way. (laughs) And there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Now I read that and think it sounds kind of harsh, like really like kind of legalistic justice, but rewind back to the ancient Near East. The year is right around 1500 BC. The world is a dark, cruel, barbaric place filled with violence. Intertribal warfare runs rampant. Ethnic cleansing is the norm. Bloody family feuds all over the place. To this day in the Middle East, there are bloody family feuds that go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Think of the Jews and the Arabs at each other's throats for millennia. Now, on top of that, think of human nature, um, or at least male human nature. Guys, if somebody punches you in the gut, what is your natural human response? (laughs) Punch him in the face, right? Am I right, guys? Somebody punches you in the gut, naturally, pre-Jesus, okay, whatever. (laughs) Your natural human response is to punch back in the face. The natural human bent is not to get even, but is to get ahead. You punch me in the gut, I want up you, and I punch you in the face. That's why violence always escalates, always, at international levels and from man to man. Now, into that world, Jesus says, listen, eye for eye, as opposed to like face for eye. Tooth for tooth, as opposed to like limbs for tooth. God here limits revenge and violence down to justice. And justice for all. When God repeats that exact same law in Leviticus and again in Deuteronomy, he says it's for the Hebrews and it's for the refugee or the illegal immigrant in today's language. 
That was unheard of for kind of the Israelite and for the refugee in the exact same space. Now today we take that idea for granted. It's called lex talionis in Latin, which means the law of retaliation. And it's where we get the idea in the modern legal system that the punishment should fit the crime. Now we take that for granted. That comes from right here. That idea in the modern justice system comes right out of Exodus chapter 21, right out of the mouth of God. Here God, thousands of years ahead of the ACLU, says the punishment should fit the crime, justice in a court of law, no vigilante revenge, none of that, I for I justice and harmony to the world. That's piece one. Now turn to the right in your Bibles to Leviticus for piece two. Leviticus 19, everybody's favorite book in the Bible. You know backwards and forwards. The majority of you are memorizing Leviticus right now. You're on verse one. 19, Yahweh said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel. Say to them, be holy because I, Yahweh your God, am holy. Now, don't get scared off by that word holy. It gets a bad rap. The word can be translated whole or complete. The idea with be holy is be whole, be complete, live in the shape God intended for humans back in the beginning. Think of the garden, be holy. Well, why? Because I, God says, Yahweh, your God, I am holy. And you are to copy me and mimic me and parrot me out in the world. You are to live like God. Now then God lays out all sorts of how, all sorts of laws for how Israel is to copy and emulate God who is holy. Look down at 17. God says, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as who? Yourself. I am Yahweh. Now, look down at your Bibles. Close reading of the text. In the text, line for line, who is your neighbor? According to Leviticus 19, verse 17. What? Fellow Israelite, front row, what's your name, dude? Zach, Zach how old are you? 18. 18, way ahead of the curve, well done. <laughs> 17 says fellow is, you're like up at 10 in the morning, which means you're ahead of the curve for an 18 year old male, right? You don't have much competition, but you're doing well, proud of you. <laughs> A fellow Israelite, and an 18, your neighbor is, and I quote, anyone among your people. Now. That said, close reading, your neighbor is your fellow Israelite. When you step back and you look at chapter 19 as a whole, is God's point here, hey, your neighbor is only your fellow Israelite, nobody else? Or is God's point here, love your neighbor as yourself? Which one? Love your neighbor, not a trick question. You're like, I think I need to stop with the trick questions, right? Love your, love your neighbor as yourself. That's God's point here. God's point is here, when, God's point here is, when you bump into conflict with people, when you bump up against people who are cruel or harsh or hurt you or wound you, hey, don't seek revenge, don't stoop to the level of violence, don't go the way, the way of hate and anger and bitterness. No, instead, love your neighbor as yourself. That's piece two. Now, turn back over to Matthew's gospel. Matthew is one of four gospels or first century biographies about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, uh, we think Jesus does his thing right around the year 30, and we think Matthew, who's one of Jesus' disciples, writes the Gospel of Matthew a few decades later, we think around 60 or 65 AD. Now, in order to make sense of Jesus' teachings and Matthew's story, you need to kind of understand bits and pieces of the background to Matthew and Jesus' world. In the first century, the Roman Empire ruled the world from England all the way to India. Caesar, ruler of the world, inventor of a salad. Right? And Pax, actually, by the way, that's not true. If you know the true story, the Caesar salad was invented, I think, in the 1940s by a Mexican chef on the Texas Mexico border who ran out of ingredients, made up a new salad dressing, and his name was Caesar, and he called it Caesar's salad, which is why all real Italian restaurants, if you order a Caesar salad, they will glare at you. Back to the story. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? You're like one of the annoying trivia people. Shut up. Okay, 
Back to the story. Roman Empire ruled the world. No Caesar salads. Pax Romana was the way of the empire, which is peace at the edge of a sword. We take over your lands, take your money, kill off your leaders, kill off your military, and then we bring you peace. And Israel was one of the many nations oppressed by the empire. We have records of exorbitant taxes. Historians estimate in between 70 and 90% taxes by corrupt bureaucratic tax collectors. The vast majority of the people, because of that, lived in abject poverty, dirt poor. Cruel Roman injustice for the poor and the populace. We have records of 30,000 Jews crucified outside the city of Jerusalem right before the time of Jesus as a show of force by the empire. Here's what happens if you mess with Caesar. Here's what happens if you mess with the ruler of the world. Now, for obvious reasons, the Jews and the Romans were friends or enemies. Enemies, flat out. And there were all sorts of opinions in Jesus' day about how to handle the Romans. Some people like the Essenes, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls from, if you know anything about that, were said, hey, let's go out into the desert, let's hide, let's retreat, let's get away from the city, away from the people, away from the Romans, let's go start a hippie commune in Eastern Oregon, right? That was the Essenes. The, the Sadducees were the educated, well-off, kind of the affluent folks in power, said, hey, no, here's a chance to make money, let's throw in with the Romans. Let's throw in with kind of the powers at B, and who cares if we lose ethnicity or we lose nationality. The Pharisees said, no, we need to keep the Torah or the law and pray for the Messiah to come. When Messiah comes, he is gonna smash and kill and slaughter all the Roman oppressors. All sorts of opinions, but we think the vast majority of the people, for the most part, said we should go to war with Rome. We should go to war. Basic logic, we are God's chosen people, if you know the story of Israel. We know God is on the side of the Jews, not the Romans. We know God is stronger than Caesar. We, we should go to war, and that's exactly what happens. A few decades after Jesus, we think only a few years or months after Matthew, AD 66, Israel declares war on Rome. Four years later, brutal de- end, the war ends in brutal defeat. Rome massacres tens of thousands of Israelis. I mean, you can go to Masada to this day and look at thousands dead up on the side of the mountain. I mean, really ugly stuff. And then again, she goes to war in 132 AD, a few decades later in the second Jewish revolt, she follows a man by the name of Bar Kokhba who claims to be the Messiah into war against Rome, ends in brutal defeat, and Rome in anger and vengeance wipes Israel off the face of the geopolitical map for upwards of 2,000 years until 1948. Point being, the majority of Jewish people in Jesus' day were hungry for war with Rome. Now that is the backstory to what Jesus gets at. Now, back to Matthew chapter five. Let's work through the text line by line. 38, one more time. You have heard that it was said, and Jesus quotes from? Exodus 21. Eye for eye, Tooth for tooth, but I tell you. Now remember, that was a rabbinic way of saying, listen up, pay attention. I know it's 10 in the morning, but what I'm about to say is really important. I am about to elucidate and show you the heart at the back of the law. I know you already know eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I'm about to show you what God was really getting at with that law. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. I love how honest and straight up Jesus is. I mean, he admits there are evil people in the world. Jesus is not a secular humanist, right? He knows people are image bearers made by God and all humans uh, bear the fingerprints of God and human DNA, absolutely. At the same time, he knows we are broken people and there are evil people who turn away from God and God's way and go to war with God's inbreaking king. There are evil people around the world and close at home. And you are going to bump into evil people in your life. It's only a matter of time. Some of you are the evil people. We pray for you. You are going to bump into evil people in your time. Now, here's what Jesus says. Okay, do not resist an evil person. Now, that word resist is really problematic, and be careful with that, how it sounds in English. A better translation, we think, is do not repay or do not seek seek revenge on an evil person. Lots of scholars translate that text, don't try to get even or don't try to get ahead and pay back. That's the idea. Paul later says in Romans, don't repay evil with evil. Instead, what Jesus does next 
is he says, okay, look for creative, healing, redemptive solutions to conflict. When you bump into evil people, don't simply, okay, you're evil, now I'm going to be evil back. You're violent, now I'm going to be violent back. No, okay, that was not God's heart with eye for eye. God's part, heart at the back of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, was healing relationships, justice, harmony, and he wants you to work for creative, redemptive, out of the box way to make relationships healthy again and right and to work for justice in gospel-shaped ways. Now next, Jesus lays out four glimpses of what that could look like and all come right out of first century life, which means we kind of take Jesus' words here as a template and transport into what that looks like here today. Look at the second half of 39. If anyone slaps you, here's the first example. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, slaps you on the right cheek, assuming the dude is right-handed, that's a backhanded slap, okay? Now, he's not talking about a fight. He's not saying, hey, you're in an alley, dude comes out with a switchblade, shank you very much, or whatever, (laughs) to rob you, okay? That's that's not what Jesus is up to here. He lives in an honor-shame society, which is kind of difficult for Westerners like you and me to kind of get at, but honor-shame society, the worst evil is not death, not poverty, not no flat-screen TV in your living room. The worst evil in Eastern kind of worldview is shame. Shame on your name, on your family's name. And the backhanded slap in Jesus' world was the ultimate insult, the ultimate way to, in public, shame somebody. I mean, that was only for slaves and prostitutes and, or children. I mean, that, that was not for anybody. Uh, that, that was the ultimate way to shame. And we don't have that, per se. We're not an honor-shame culture, but we have blogs and tweets and whispers and gossip and slander. We have all sorts of ways that people insult you, shame you, embarrass you, hurt you, malign your name. Okay, Jesus says, let's say that happens. Let's say somebody backhand slaps you, in public shames you. Here's a creative, healing, gospel-shaped way to deal with that. Don't fight back. Don't punch back. Don't, you know, here's violence, here's shame, here's dishonor, here's yelling and screaming. No, here's a gospel way. Turn the other cheek. He doesn't say run away. He says turn the other cheek. And the idea is not simply, here, take it. The idea is deeper than that. The idea is actually turn with no violence, no anger, no hate, and look the man in the eye and actively engage the person who's inflicting harm on you. Actively engage face to face that man or woman. Look at Jesus' next example. 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Right? In Jesus' day, there were only two, well, three articles of clothing, loincloth, not that you care, and a shirt, which was more like a dress in today's kind of fashion, and a coat, which doubled as your blanket at night. Now, by law, it was actually illegal to take a man's coat for more than a few hours because it was his lifeline. It was the way, I mean, it was, it was, his, it was his shelter at night. Absolutely illegal to take a man's coat. Shirt, on the other hand, was up for grabs. Jesus say, okay, which kind of is a little weird to me, but okay. Jesus says, let's say you go to court, somebody sues you, and somebody is out for blood. I mean, somebody wants every dime, every penny. He wants your shirt, the shirt off your back, literally. Okay, here's a creative, redemptive gospel way to deal with that. You don't hire a more, he doesn't say hire a more expensive lawyer, right? Now, here's a gospel way to deal with that. Give him your shirt and give him your coat as well. And I know that exposes your nakedness and you have nothing, but it also exposes his greed. Your lavish, instead of responding with violence, anger, hate, a more expensive lawyer, instead you respond with lavish generosity. You respond with grace and mercy and an honor shame society in a loving, kind, nonviolent way. You shame him into repentance. It's a creative, out-of-the-box idea. Then look what Jesus says in 41. Here's the last, the third example. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. By Roman law, a Roman military officer could force you, if you were Jewish, to walk, to carry his pack, which was right around 40 or 50 pounds, for a thousand paces, which was right around a mile, at the drop of a hat. You're on your way to work, synagogue, school, whatever. Military officer walks around the corner. Hey, you, here's my pack. Boom, carry and he keeps walking. You have to turn around and walk for an entire mile with a heavy pack, male, female, child, doesn't matter, for a mile with the soldier, and then you are done. That was like a common everyday experience for first century Jews up in the Galilee. 
That's one of the things I love and hate about Jesus' teachings is that he refuses to keep theology like kind of up here in theory in the clouds. He refuses for you and me to have kind of your personal individualistic walk with Jesus over here in private. He drags the gospel into everyday life. When a Roman military officer says, here's my pack, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, right? When whatever, when somebody sends that nasty email, here is what the gospel looks like. And Jesus says, okay, here's a creative, redemptive way to deal with that. You go the mile, the smile on your face, and then you go a second mile, and you love that soldier, you serve that soldier who is your enemy. He's the Roman, he's the oppressor. Are you out of your mind, Jesus? You're supposed to be the Messiah. You're supposed to kill off all the Romans, and now you're saying love and serve the Romans? Love and serve the oppressor? Yeah. And show him in that that you're not a victim. You're not oppressed, you're not weak. In love, make a voluntary choice, which is one of the things that injustice rips away from people is the power of choice. Make a choice to love and serve that man in a redemptive way. And then here's the last example, 42. Give to the one who asks you, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Remember, the vast majority of people are dirt poor, beggars, ubiquitous on the streets. Jesus says, when somebody comes up to you for money, hey, don't turn your back, don't get away from that conflict. Hey, don't bother me, hey, get out of my way, get out of my face. But instead, turn and actively engage the man or woman. Now he does not say, give him all the money he asks for. In fact, we know from Portland that's often the worst case scenario. First thing you learn from Portland Rescue Mission and folks like that is don't give a dime, that's not the way to help. But he does say, give to anyone who asks you. It, no matter when, inconvenient, out of your time, out of your way, no matter who comes, you turn, you actively engage, and you work for justice in the world. Now, four kind of micro stories. People take Jesus' four stories here one of two ways. One crew of people takes Jesus' words hyper-literally and turns Jesus' four stories into hard and fast rules you need to obey, right? Turn the other cheek means you are never allowed to fight back ever. And uh, give him your coat means you are never allowed to go to court ever. And that may or may not be true, but that is problematic. That sparks all kinds of problems. Well, what if somebody slaps my wife? What if somebody slaps my child? What if somebody slaps me, but he's not, I mean, it's in an alley and he's there to rob or kill or cut my throat. What about that? Is self-defense always wrong? Yes, no, like what is Jesus? He doesn't say anything about that. And if they are simply hard and fast rules, well, that means we can be religious people, right? You can obey the rule, turn the other cheek one time and then punch the man in the face. Hey, I obey Jesus, right? You can carry the man's pack for a second mile and at the end of mile two, drop the pack on the ground. Hey, I'm a disciple of Jesus and I'm done with you. (laughs) That's like the literal reading. Now that's one way. Other people, and here's where I think the majority of people are, other people simply explain, explain Jesus' words away. Well, that sounds really nice, Jesus, in a sermon, but that's not how, I don't know what world you live in, but that's not my world. I'm a pragmatist, and that's not how the world operates. That is not how the world works. That's not how you deal with people who are after you. It's not how you deal with oppressors. We don't solve conflict like that, Jesus. We solve conflict with fists and knives and guns and weapons and tanks and bombers and wars and high expensive lawyers and class action suits, and that's how we deal with conflict in a broken world. That's why I think the vast majority of followers of Jesus in the West are. I think, my opinion, that the vast majority of Jesus' followers, in particular in Western Europe, have yet to take Jesus' teachings on nonviolence seriously. We don't actually believe that Jesus is onto something. We don't actually believe that what Jesus says here works. One, uh, one of the most, and it's odd, but shaping moments of my life was when I was in fifth grade, and um, there was a bully in my class, and I was not exactly like a tough jock in fifth grade, right? I don't think that surprises anybody here. Um, I was a pianist, and, and that's only cool if you're the lead singer of Coldplay and your wife is Gwyneth Paltrow, right? 
that's not cool when you're in fifth grade. Um, oh, you go to football practice. I play my piano. Um, that's not cool. And there was a bully, and he wasn't like beating me up or anything like that, but he was making my life, I mean, hell, right? I mean, really, really bad. Like every day, day in, day out, after my, out for blood. And I remember coming home from one day, crying to my mommy, and, and I remember my mom said, okay, here's the plan. His name was Derek. How much, like the year was like what? What's fifth grade? How old are you in fifth grade? 10? Okay, the year was 1990. H- how much is like, like Derek, like a 90s bad guy name, right? Like Derek, right? Like if your name's Derek, I'm sorry, you're probably right around early 30s, but I'm sure you were a bully in 1990, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and she says, okay, here's the plan. We're going to have Derek over to play tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> what? <laughs> are, you, are you out of your mind? What in the what? Oh, no, absolutely not. I remember going to school the next day. Derek, would you like to come over and play? <laughs> the piano with me? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and he comes over that afternoon. We throw the football afternoon. Or he throws, I get hit by the ball all afternoon. <laughs> and, and true story, we have a great time. And from that day on, he was the kindest, most, je- I was like in his, he was like my, my protector from that day on. <laughs> the best of friends going forward. I, and that, like in fifth grade, 10 years old, and that, that shaped me in a weird way. Like, holy cow, Jesus is actually smart. We laugh, but lots of you don't actually think of Jesus as smart. We all think of Jesus as holy. We don't always think of Jesus as smart, brilliant, creative, way ahead of his time, way smarter than anybody out there. He knows what life is like in a broken world. He knows from the cross. He knows full well. And he also knows how God made humans. And he knows there are other nonviolent, creative ways to work for justice in the world. And lots of us have yet to take Jesus seriously and actually think, wow, you're smart, you know better, let's, ex- let's, let's experiment. What could that look like? Really, there are only you know, a few examples of once in a while there are leaders who come along and take Jesus seriously. The two obvious examples from the last century are Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Gandhi was not a follower of Jesus, he was a Hindu, but he was shaped by the teachings of Jesus on ethics and he based his entire, entire nonviolent movement in India to liberate India from the Brits all on Matthew chapter five. On today's text in India was all based on Matthew five, the teachings of Jesus and what Tolstoy said about Jesus. Dr. King was in, well, not perfect by any means, we all know that, but he was a follower of Jesus, he was a Baptist, and he based his entire civil rights movement, which now is kind of disconnected from the church, but in that day was coming out of the church. And he based his entire nonviolent civil rights movement for equality around America all on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it comes as no surprise, those are two of the greatest figures in the last century, if not in all of human history, because a few guys had the guts to say, wow, what if Jesus is actually smart? What if he's actually onto something? What if there are other creative ways to work for justice in the world? Now, my point here is that some people take Jesus' word like rules. Other people simply explain Jesus' words away. Well, that's not, that's not practical. That's not how the world works. Both are wrong. What they really are are examples of the gospel-shaped heart, glimpses of what life looks like under God's inbreaking kingdom, what disciples of Je- how disciples of Jesus could and should live in the, the time between the times, in the now and not yet, in the broken, messy world, but also in light of God's inbreaking kingdom and what God is doing in the gospel of Jesus. Here are samples, examples, glimpses of how we could and should live as we follow Jesus. And all of that builds up to the last example what Jesus says next. Back to your Bibles. Look at 43. He goes on. You have heard that it was said, and he quotes from Leviticus 19, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, those of you who have been around for a while, you know the scriptures really well. Does the Bible from Genesis to Malachi or after that anywhere say one time, hate your enemy? Nope. Nowhere. God never says that. Not once. The first half of that quote, love your neighbor, comes right, as you know, out of Leviticus 19. The second half is nowhere to be found in the law and the prophets. 
That, we think, was the popular reading or interpretation of Leviticus 19 in Jesus' day. We have records from the Essenes, Dead Sea Scrolls, who were reading Leviticus 19 as, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Your neighbor is your fellow, fellow Jew. Everybody else, like the pagans, like the Romans, are your enemy, hate your enemy. And Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Hey, listen, but I tell you, here's the deeper meaning. Here was God's heart with that. Listen, God's point was not your neighbor as your fellow Jew. God's heart was love people. Don't seek revenge. Don't go the way of hate. Don't go the way of violence. There are other ways. Love your enemy. That was God's heart. That's the plot line. Step back. Look at the scriptures as a whole. Look at the story of God from creation through the fall to the mission of God from Abraham and past that. What God has been doing for thousands of years is working to love his enemies. That's what God is up to. That's what God is like. Love your enemy. And that word love is agape in the Greek. It does not mean feel warm, fuzzy emotions about your enemy, about your abuser, about terrorists, about you fill in the blank. No, it means it has more to do with the will than with emotions. And emotions are important, but it means you make a conscious decision to work for the well-being of your enemy to work and pray and fight and bleed for the good of your enemy, to work for the flourishing of the man, the woman who hates you, hurts you, abuses you, wrongs you. Love your enemy. That is, I think, one of, if not the most controversial, subversive statements in the history of the world. I think that teaching right there is what sets Jesus apart from 99.9% of all the other teachers in human history. Nobody says that. There are other teachers who teach pacifism, but no, Jesus is the only one I know of who flat out says, love your enemy. Please notice the difference. Jesus is not teaching pacifism. He's not saying, hey, turn the other cheek, take it, run away, deal with. What he's teaching is way harder than pacifism. He's teaching, yes, he's saying, I think, hey, we, you know, as followers of Jesus, we don't fight violence with violence. We don't fight bloodshed with bloodshed. We don't fight evil with evil. But what he's saying is way deeper than that. He's saying you are called as followers of Jesus to actively overcome evil with good. That's a whole other ball game. Wow, that was a jock analogy right there. Look at that. That's a whole, that's a whole other overcome evil with good. Paul goes on to say if your enemy is hungry, what? Feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, Here's a drink. You are to actively go past pacifism and work in nonviolent, creative ways for justice, work for the well-being of your enemy, work for the flourishing, the good, and the joy of your enemy. I mean, that's insane. Don't explain that away. That is the gospel of Jesus. Now, I know that sparks all kinds of questions we don't have time to get into about war and the military and followers of Jesus in the military. Is that okay or not? Some people think absolutely. Others think no way and all sorts of opinions. What about just war versus pacifism versus nonviolence? What about police? What about self-defense? What about taekwondo? What about all that, right? (laughs) And we're not going to get into any of that right now. Jesus does not hear in the text. It's a really complex, multipolar, and important theology for you to wrap your head around another day. For now, Jesus simply answers two questions. He says, love your enemies. That's like 30,000 feet what God wants for his followers. And then he says, he answers two questions, how and why. Look what he says next. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How? Pray. Now, there are other ways to love your enemies, serve your enemies, generosity with your enemies, all sorts of other creative ways. But here's one for every single man or woman on the planet. No matter what culture you come from, age, male, female, doesn't matter. Here's a way you can all love your enemy. Pray. Pray for those who persecute you. And I don't think Jesus here means, you know, pray, God, kill my enemy. (laughs) Right? Or God, give me victory over my enemy, which is a well-known Western European prayer. Actually, everybody prays that. I don't think that's what Jesus means. I think Jesus actually means pray for your enemy. Pray for God's blessing, God's salvation, God's incoming kingdom to come over your enemy. 
If he or she knows Jesus but is off and how he treats you, pray for God's blessing, pray for well-being, pray for healing, pray for God to step into that man or woman's life and work for good. Now, the majority of you know from experience that is really hard, am I right? But it's doable. You can do that. I can do that in the spirit of Jesus. Hard, yes, doable. Now, your prayer may be really short, (laughs) but that's doable. I mean, I have found in my story, and I mean, lots of you, like, I mean, my story is nothing compared to some of the pain and some of the violence that has been done to you. But in my story, there are kind of two times in my life where I felt I was really wrong. I felt I was really, long story, doesn't matter. And in both stories, in both experiences, it was prayer for my enemy that was hands down the liberating moment in my journey to healing. Because what happens when you pray for your enemy is that your heart changes. If you pray for your enemy long enough, he ceases to be your enemy. And you move from being a bitter, angry, hurt victim, I can't believe he, I can't believe she, I'm hurt, I'm wounded, I'm a victim, to being a loving, empathetic disciple of Jesus. Not perfect, human with them all, but you get God's eyes You see that person through God's eyes. You see that experience through God's humble, gospel-shaped lens, and it changes your heart. And you go from bitterness and anger to empathy and love and mercy and grace. And we're not perfect, and we, God knows that, but your heart actually changes. And out of that, God, when you start to pray for those who persecute you, if you're open, if you practice listening prayer, if prayer is not only a one-way street, but you listen to God, God starts to implant creative ideas in your mind, like the four in the story. Here's what you could do. Here's how you could handle this. Here's how you could handle that. God starts to actively speak to you about how to actively engage the person who hurts you, wrongs you, your enemy. That's how. Pray, he says. We can all do that. Hard but doable. Now, then he goes on and he says, why? 45, that you may be, here's why, that you may be children of your Father in the heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Most of the time he does the latter here in Portland. But that's what God is like. Now, why? Okay, love your enemy. How? Pray. Why? Because you are sons and daughters of the Father. And that is what God is like. Please listen. That is how God treats his enemies. And Jesus alludes to what in theology is called common grace, which is the idea, hey, God sends sun and rain on the righteous and the unrighteous side by side. God, the creator of the universe, looks down at the world, looks down at humanity, and he blesses his sons and his daughters who love God and his enemies who hate, blaspheme, malign, go to war against God's kingdom. He blesses them with the exact same world, the exact same oxygen, the exact same food, the same drink, the same gifts, talents, mental ingenuity, creativity, intelligence, the same opportunity, the same beautiful world, the same sunrise and sunset, the same he blesses, he gives and he gives and he gives to people who hate, blaspheme, rebel against God. Here's oxygen, here's food, here's water, here's beauty, here's joy of being alive. That's how God treats his enemies. That's what God is like. That's how God treats you. That's how God treats me. No hate, no vengeance. That's what God is like. And then Jesus goes on and he says, 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Even the tax collectors, right? Who were the worst of the worst in Jesus' day. I mean, it's not like IRS agents are popular today. But in Jesus' day, tax collectors were Jews who worked for the empire. Remember, 70 to 90 percent. I mean, corrupt, horrific Worst of the worst. And then he says, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Romans do that. If you only love people who are like you and who look like you and dress like you and wear skinny jeans like you and listen to music like you and are the exact same politicians as you or vote like you, that's not love. I mean, that's not loving somebody. That's, that's loving yourself. That's self-love. That means you think you are amazing. 
And whenever you bump into somebody who looks like you, dresses like you, thinks like you, votes like you, you're like, I like this guy. He reminds me of me. I like this guy. That's not love at all. That's not the gospel. Hey, pagans love pagans. Terrorists love terrorists. Atheists love atheists. You love people who are like you? Well done. Okay, hoorah. I mean, who cares? Right? How are you any different from anybody else on the street? What should set followers of Jesus apart? What should make you and me like nobody else on the planet is that you actually love your enemy. Nobody does that. Not even pacifists. Nobody does it. You actually, not even Canadians. Nobody does that. <laughs> you actually love your enemies. That is what should set you apart from everybody on the planet. Now, all of that leads up to one last stunning remark. Look at 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, don't get scared off by that line. Lots of people read, be perfect, and they're like, okay, I'm out. I'm done. Close Bible, right? Don't get scared off by that. For starters, Jesus is simply rephrasing Leviticus 19, verse 1. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. He's rephrasing that well-known text in light of God's inbreaking kingdom, what God is up to, and now the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the word perfect is teleoi in the Greek. It's where we get the word teleology. If you remember that from like freshman philosophy class, teleology or purpose or intent, it can be translated live in the shape God intended like your heavenly father. And in Jesus' day, it was used by all sorts of Greek authors to simply mean mature. It was used of children who grow up into adulthood. It can be translated, be mature, grow up and act mature like your heavenly father is mature. He's simply saying, live out all the teachings from chapter five, live all of that stuff out. Now, don't get hung up on the first part, be perfect. If anything, get hung up on the second part, as your heavenly father is perfect. Remember that in today's world, heavenly father is a borderline cliche. In Jesus' world, heavenly father was right on the edge of blasphemy. Nobody called the creator God Yahweh. Nobody called Yahweh Yahweh. He was the name. He was Hashem. Nobody called God your heavenly father. Maybe Israel's father kind of, but my father? Nobody called God that in the first sentence. And nobody at all. Jesus' imagery here is rich. That of a family. That of sons, of daughters, who have been adopted into God's family, like orphans off the street out of abject poverty. My wife and I are adopting right now out of an orphanage where 90% of the babies are dropped off in plastic bags at hospitals and police stations, a few days old, freezing. I mean, that's what God's done for you, chases after you, goes and adopts you into God's family. And now Jesus says, you are sons and daughters of God. Remember how Jesus starts the sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's how he starts. Not with be perfect, he starts with blessed. Remember, God comes down the ladder, he breaks in, he just demolishes religion once and for all. He gets rid of the ladder, he comes after you, he rescues and he saves, and then he says, now you're rescued, you're saved, you're sons, you're daughters, you're in my family, you're loved by God, you're loved by the Father. Be perfect, be mature. Live like a son. Live like a daughter, live up to the family name. Live in your new reality. Live in your new family. That's all God is saying. Now, what does that have to do with eye for eye and love your neighbor as yourself? Everything. Um, I'm a dad, as you know. I have two little boys. Jude is six. Moses is three. And my boys, from time to time, get into conflict, right? Somebody smashes the other brother's Lego, whatever. Conflict, problems, somebody wounds or hurts the other, in my family, literally, um, hurts or whatever. And when we sit down to work out the conflict, work out the details, and we sit down, and let's say, you know, Moses, who's three, smashes Jude's Lego thing, which would never happen in my house, but it does. Um, in that scenario, whose job is it to measure out justice and discipline? Whose job? Their moms, right? 
No, it's my job. It's the Father's job. It's not Jude's job to measure out justice and discipline Moses and make sure Moses gets what's coming, right? No, that's my job. That's the Father's job. Jude's job is simply to love and forgive and trust me. If it goes the other way around, if, Moses wrongs, if Jude wrongs Moses, Moses' job is simply to agape Jude, forgive, forget, move on, and to trust me, the loving father, to measure out justice, and justice is important, harmony is important in a family, in a nation, in a world, to measure out justice, to discipline in a loving, right, unbiased way. His job is simply to love and to trust. That's the imagery. Your sons, your daughters, you're adopted, you're loved. You're loved by the creator of the universe. You don't have to take vengeance into your own hands. You don't have to fight for your name, fight for your reputation. You don't have to get even. You don't have to make the world right. God will do all of that, if not now, in the future at judgment when he makes the world new. God will do all of that. Your job is to love, forgive, move on, and to abandon yourself to the love of the Father, to trust, to take a deep breath, let go of hate, let go of anger, let go of fear, let go of your reputation, let go of your name, and trust. Abandon yourself to the Father, because that is what God is like. Let's pray.